Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Dr. Ying Li to International Week 2022, and also welcome to all participants. My name is Fitri Amalia, and I will be the moderator of today's session. First of all, thank you, Dr. Lee, for joining us today, and thank you for your time uh, in sharing about a very interesting topic related to business digitalization in the post-COVID era. So today we have a total of uh, more than 60 participants from more than 10 countries, um, who I believe are all eager to hear you present, and they will all later on also participate in the um, interesting discussion. So we, before we start this session, I would like to briefly introduce Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee is a chief scientist at EV Analysis Corporation and a chief science officer at Awantunai. Dr. Lee holds a doctoral degree in computer science from the University of British Columbia, Canada, and she is an inventor of over 100 patents, filled or granted in data mining, text mining, machine learning, and software optimization. She has she has also experienced in leadership experience in privacy and governance and IT compliance, creation of data mining insights, and also applied research capabilities. And um, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Lee to present um, about business digital, digi digitalization in post-COVID era. And a friendly reminder that um, you have 60 minutes to present, which is followed by the 30 minutes of question and answer session. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Ying Li. I'm the Chief Science Officer for Avantunai. Avantunai is um, uh, a company that provides business solutions and software services for traditional trade suppliers and merchants. Um, the purpose of the software uh, solutions and services are for digitizing inventory ordering, payment, and uh, customer management. My work at Avant Tonight is mainly to solve some of the problems that data science and machine learning could help uh, for enabling and scaling the access of financing to the micro SMEs. We have a mission to help um, micro SMEs prosper. I'm thankful for this opportunity of sharing uh, my experience with you on this topic of uh, digitization for the traditional trade business. Um, I will start with a quick context setting um, about what we work with, that is the micro, small, and medium enterprises in the traditional fast-moving consumer goods sector, so micro SMEs in FMCG sector. Um, I will then introduce some of the needs that those micro SMEs experiences, followed by tools and solutions we provide for solving some of those needs. Thirdly, as illustrations of uh, opportunities for helping business grow, I will present a few problems that we have attempted to solve and some initial results. So for those not familiar, I want to give the context by showing a glimpse of what the traditional trade looked like, especially uh, as introduced that uh, we have uh, people from 10 countries. Um, so people may have a different experience. Here's a picture of a store, um, typically uh, carrying food, personal hygiene, home care, and so on. Um, items and selling to consumers in the neighborhood in general, in the nearby neighborhood of the store. In the context of this talk, we'll refer them uh, as merchant, right? So here's another picture. This one is a back room of a store that uh, mainly sells to the merchant. So the back room is like a warehouse attached to the storefront. You can see the supplies are arranged and organized. So when the merchant, the previous uh, store owner, come to the supplier, to uh, uh, what we call supplier, to buy supplies uh, to, to stock their inventories, the orders are handled at the storefront, and the store clerks will fetch those items to fill the orders from the immediate uh, room or next to the, to the storefront. We would refer to them um, 
as suppliers in the context of this talk. So by the way, you see um, the SOFL, uh, again, for people maybe not from Indonesia, uh, this is a really good um, mosquito repellent. My son would go through 10 bottles of them each summer. All right. So we want to take a look at the characteristic of those uh, traditional trade. So the traditional trade mainly is face-to-face um, -face transactions uh, in person coming to the store. Even if we called ahead of time, you would still come to the store and payment in cash. Um, transaction data usually is offline. Um, yet, majority of the global domestic consumption is supplied traditionally. So traditional versus modern. So the modern are some of the, the, the chains, uh, the convenience stores that, um, that um, uh, hyper stores and mini marts. So that's um, different from here traditional store. So um, here I quote, some high level stats about traditional trade in FMCG. Um, by the way, I have provided reference that you may find at the end of uh, the slides, um, some details of, uh, about research and statistics on the micro SMEs. All right, so to help these micro, uh, micro SMEs, merchants and suppliers, if we want to help them sub, uh, prosper, we want to start with to look at their supply chains. And here we want to look at a very simplified supply chain, right? So the entities in this um, FMCG supply chain are principles. Principles are referred to as the brand owners, the manufacturers, or the brand names like a PG, Unilever, PepsiCo. Um, other entities are suppliers merchants and uh, consumers, right? So the suppliers would um, buy inventory from principals and the merchant would buy inventory from suppliers and then sell to the uh, end consumer. So this, again, like I said, this is a very simplified uh, uh, view, but yet the spirit is a good one that mainly we want to look at the flows in the chain, right? So the top line is inventory flows from uh, principal to supplier to merchant to consumer, and uh, and then payment flow the other direction. Um, with this, along with the flow of inventory and payment, we also have the bi-directional information flow. So, you know. This perhaps is fairly familiar with some of you in the audience. Um, as I do not uh, know uh, your backgrounds, so I want to just um, present a very simplex, a simplified view. Okay. Right. So we want to further uh, zooming in to the flows, you know, be between the suppliers and the merchant, especially in the traditional trade. So if we look at them, examine them more carefully, um, we actually find, have, you know, it's, it's known that the others are given in handwritten notes, photos of uh, notes or voice messages or texts. So oftentimes over WhatsApp or done it in offline walk-ins. So payments are mostly in cash, sometimes in store credit. So there are some store credit among the uh, traditional trade. Um, you know, the merchant would come to the supplier for the last 40 years. I've uh, talked with uh, some of the uh, suppliers, um, including the second or third generation store owners. Their parents has, have been given to the other, to the stores uh, in the neighborhood for credit for the last years. So that happens as well. So uh, because the inventories are stored in an offline manner, right? So the stock levels are inferred usually by visual or in intuition. Uh, replenishment is guided by experience. So the kind of store owners kind of know when to replenish and they, you know, definitely they can look at their warehouse and they know their selling speed. So 
but demand is general is uh, uh, again demand is kind of forecasted or guessed by experience and actually uh, with uh, today's you know whatsapp groups um, some merchants uh, would pull from their you know, uh, suppliers would pull from their merchants to say, you know, what do you think of this SQ item? Do you think we need quite a bit more or less? So they can um, uh, forecast it a little bit. Um, one more note is though that in studying the supply chain, some of the suppliers have never done a complete inventory counting, right? So, you know, to run the store, to you know, to control the inventory, you kind of have to know your baseline, but uh, it's actually some of the stores, the owner have never done one because it takes time and it, it incurs uh, uh, disruption to the store hours. They often felt that they cannot afford it. One supplier whom I actually talked to, uh, the store opens seven days a week, uh, 10 to 12 hours each day, they cannot have the downtime of the store, um, physical store to actually count inventories. Um, so if we further study the needs of uh, those micro SMEs uh, in the traditional FMCG trade, um, we visited many suppliers and merchants we conducted the persona interviews and experimented with various uh, uh, pilot tests and experiments. The needs are many, and we look at some examples. So you, here you can see that I look at some of, some of the needs. Uh, I line them up uh, in the, uh, with the length of the, the flows of inventory, flows of payment, and flows of uh, information. So finding good sources of a product uh, to stock the store uh, is, is oftentimes their most um, important urgent need. Uh, they often use cheap price as the most important criteria to select the goodness of the source. Um, basically, the cheapest is the, is the best. Um, they also need to prepare orders that's coming from all channels. So today's uh, suppliers may receive orders uh, from their merchant by phone call, um, by some other channels, or they know they would come on you know, certain days of the week. They need to prepare the orders ahead of time. If the store serves, say, 200 merchants or 500 merchants, um, they can be very busy in each day um, so that they would need to hire uh, store clerks to help prepare the others uh, ahead of time or in real time to handle the flow of uh, the traffic in the store. So um, their financial need, oftentimes they do need to obtain then uh, and to, to apply and obtain um, uh, working capitals uh, to purchase inventories. This is a, one of their main concern, main need for growing their business. So um, another one is to reduce the cash on hand. So many of them have actually real serious concern about the security. If the business grows, they sell more, they have a more cash on hand in the store, they cannot leave the store. And it's also very hard to easily delegate. So the main barriers for uh, those uh, micro SMEs to obtain finance um, are cash handling, credit access, fulfillment, and inventory management. So as I said, you can see the need for digitization actually can solve uh, some of these and can be um, particularly helpful to overcome the barriers. So Avant Tonight is a company established in 2017 with the aim to support micro SMEs um, in the FMCG sector to grow their business through digitization of inventory ordering, payment, and customer management. Specifically, uh, its business solutions that include the functionality like inventory uh, management, order management, uh, and uh, the uh, point of sales uh, support. They also have a, a mobile app called Avantoco in the Google Store. 
uh, that enables micro merchant to make purchase orders uh, to suppliers online through the app. The financing for the, for the micro SMEs to purchase inventories are embedded in this uh, process, in this business software and in the service. Um, this will enable the merchant and suppliers to, uh, to finance inventory purchase digitally. Right? So this will solve the cash issue, will solve the financing issue, and help also manage the inventory. Um, in order to sustain affordable financing, so affordable is the key uh, to really provide um, uh, as low as, as possible and then earth and then really affordable financing to the suppliers and merchants. We need to utilize the information flow in the supply chain. So we can, so I'd like us to look at the uh, information uh, flow again in this chain. So let's like, uh, realistically, the interactions between principal suppliers, merchants and customers, consumers are more like this one. So where the relationships are more of the nature of many to many, right? And then there are many types and special, particularly, specialties and types of suppliers, distributors, wholesalers, many of them. And then they often also trade among themselves or, you know, a small one buying from a bigger one, right? So this is more realistic. Um, in the information flow, it actually, it's more like this, that where I use the dash line to indicate where we cannot assume the data are complete and 100% accurate, right? Many factors could render the information flow to be incomplete or inaccurate. For instance, fraudulent activities, which does happen, uh, will make the data inaccurate, be certain behavior, certain purchasing are not real and yet getting the financing um, or not the, uh, quite the right owner uh, of the account to make the order. Um, so adoption rate is another uh, reason that would render the data incomplete if uh, the supplier or merchant use the system, but sometimes not all the traffic goes through, it may not be complete. But still, it's important to know that even with the incomplete and noisy data, we already start to accumulate quite a bit of data that's really um, uh, valuable that we already can accomplish some of the meaningful uh, tasks towards uh, solving the problem for the micro SMEs and for our business as, uh, at the same time. We can assume the transactions, so the solid line here, we can assume the transactions between suppliers and merchant, which is our focus here, to be uh, accurate and complete within the scope of this network, within our, no our own network, okay? So that's what uh, we will assume to move forward. So, so let me quickly show an example of the data. So this is an order by a merchant purchasing inventory at a supplier. You can see the items. Um, you can see we, we also have, uh, we have uh, obviously a whole lot more columns to the data uh, with the merchant ID, uh, potentially with the address or the device ID. Um, so uh, this, you know, sometimes we refer to the order as a basket as well, you know, shopping basket. So on average, uh, a merchant order could contain seven to eight SKUs, uh, the stock, uh, stock keeping unit SKUs. So this is look like a typical um, order of a merchant um, to the sub, uh, at the supplier side. Uh, they, it's important to know that they replenish their stock very often, uh, almost daily, some even twice a day. Um, also because of uh, maybe because of they need to turn over the uh, inventory so that we, they have more working capital. And so this is where, again, that we have seen the data um, multiple uh, places where we can help with uh, some affordable financing. We can help 
that the owners can stay in the store more often without closing the store so that they, because they, you know, they have to come to um, purchase the, uh, the product inventory. So it's also just, I also want to mention the top categories and subcategories um, uh, are machine classified. So if you see, if, if you spot an error anywhere in the data, sample data, um, this is because it's uh, uh, classified by our machine algorithm. So we have two, two, level, two uh, level hierarchy of product categories. So this will help us analyze the product. Um, uh, in, a, in a more aggregated way and more actionable uh, when we need to uh, work at the categorical level. So it, just to show one more example, and this one uh, obviously much bigger and still a fairly typical um, uh, uh, order. And um, so the, the, as I said, we can assume this transaction data to be complete and accurate, right? So, but however, from the data science perspective, we still face issues. For instance, the product name may show up with a slightly, slightly difference in their spelling or perhaps a spelling error or because uh, they are entered at the uh, supplier end. Um, also, a product may be called differently by different suppliers. And when data, when the product name included uh, product attributes, such as those are showing in um, row um, number one and number two, see, so they have different packaging or different properties of the essentially same product, which actually is important to know the packaging, the size, the different uh, variants. So by the way, the, the Indomie um, Gorin row number seven, is our family favorite. We actually can even uh, purchase it uh, get a, We have a constant uh, uh, story of uh, Migorin in our household in the US actually. Um, so from the solution provider's perspective, to help us suppliers and merchants, the micro SMEs become more prosper, it, these can be translated into some of the um, tool providing tools and service to help micro SMEs sell more and sell faster, right? So the, from the business needs, we need to provide tools and service to help them sell faster. Uh, we need, in the meantime, reduce our own operational cost because if we want to help other prosper and then proper financing, we need to keep the cost low on our end, as well as the cost of financing low for the for the micro SMEs. Um, on the payment side, to be able to provide affordable financing in a sustainable way, it means that we need to automate or partially automate the credit approval process so that we can scale. Uh, as you recall, uh, there are four or five millions of uh, micro SMEs in the FMCG sector or the traditional trade to uh, serve much larger numbers of merchants and suppliers. We need to scale up so that we can reduce uh, our own business cost. And in the meantime, simplify the application process. So for instance, for a merchant to apply for credit, uh, they need to fill out applications. What can we do to make it extremely simple for them to apply for credit? And yet we can, um, we can maintain uh, the quality and control the risk. Right, so that would be the uh, a real important business need to address. Um, the more we understand the suppliers and merchants, and and we uh, and the more we understand their needs, their way of uh, running their business, the better we can help them. So those are uh, from a you know business perspective, we need to provide these capabilities. Well, then from a data science perspective, right? So um, we, employ, uh, we, 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 we employ data science methodologies to help solve some of the problems and solve some of the 
micro SME needs and the business needs as well. So for instance, uh, we invent methodology for compute and uh, analyze the inventory movement, right? So even when there are insufficient data, we still need to uh, be able to help analyzing the inventory movement, which means we need to invent some methodology. Um, textbook will, te will, will show how to compute inventory turnover, uh, but in reality, when you have um, almost um, insufficient data or uh, data with much noise, how could we ensure uh, the inventory turnover, even a simple concept, uh, still can be computed and still uh, computed with reasonable usefulness to the uh, merchant and suppliers, right? So we also conduct applied research and build uh, recommender systems to make a product recommendation to merchant. Uh, I will show some examples of uh, work that we have done to demonstrate those ideas. Um, I also want to mention that we have built a loan approval models to start automate the uh, approval process. We start with a conservative approach where when the machine learning model is very certain that we should approve this application, uh, the application is automatically approved. And when the application um, is you know, below the threshold where the machine learning would accept as approval, then we will send uh, the case to human uh, analyst for further uh, inspection. So this is uh, out of the principle that we want to um, help as much merchants as possible so that we don't want to blindly reject um, um, an application. Uh, we also have a, a manual process for managing fraud and risk. And now uh, in this, uh, in this uh, digital digitization process, it worked very well, uh, manually inspection. But in the meantime, as we reduce the cost and uh, scale the operation, we are investing in uh, R&D to detect um, or, or alert fraud through machine learning and data science method. I'll show one analysis that may be interesting and potentially effective. So um, let me walk through a quick analysis uh, related to inventory. And uh, this is based on the data from one supplier, right? So think about the one store that sells to merchants. Um, for, for this supplier, uh, from this uh, supplier, we have a uh, snapshot data, but we don't have a complete real-time inventory data. So we don't have the um, you know, item by item real-time movement of the inventory. So still uh, meaningful analysis can, can be done. So here we compute the selling quantity versus a uh, unit margin. So for each SKU, uh, we place them in quadrant. So depending on whether it does, its selling quantity is above average or below average, right? So if you line up S, every SKU at the end of the month or at the end of a time window, you know how many you sold. And then you, know, you cut the average. So those above average or those no, below no. average. Um, right, and then you also, uh, line up the SKU according to the, their uh, unit margin. So those above and those below. So you place them in the, you know, the, the quadrant, right? So Q1 are the ones that uh, have the sold a lot and uh, have a very high margin, right? So those items. So I'm looking at two screens, uh, sorry, looking at you and looking at two screens, right? So um, Q1, and then Q3 are the ones that sold a lot, um, but uh, each SKU by themselves has a below average unit margin, right? So, um, so we can make some observations from some of the data. So this is the setup. We look at the quadrant on the left, if you see this picture. So we see uh, fewer SKUs are above average uh, unit margin, right? So fewer at the top than below, right? And then, uh, and still 
uh, fewer SKUs are you know, above a sold quantity. So you can see, you can imagine the distribution curve, right? The Q1s and Q3s have sold a lot more for each, by each of them so that they are, you know, uh, they have much less items in each quadrant, right? Um, this seems to be uh, common, you know, in think about the typical distribution curves in, in, in commerce or e-commerce seems to be uh, uh, common. But if we look at the bar chart to the right, uh, we can see the highest profit were generated by Q1. Um, you know, higher profit total. We look at the profit for all the SKU in the quadrant, right? And then, and then for Q3, this is a, 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 a generate you know traffic generator. The majority of the revenue, if you look at the this chart majority of revenue are generated by Q3, right? So then you can see because Q3 is here, also traffic, so a huge amount of sold quantities, um, on average sold quantity. So then the supplier, if we were to help supplier to optimize their inventory and um, uh, composition, they may consider increase some of the price of some items in Q3 maybe, and because to take advantage of some of the popularities of some of the items, all right, to increase the profit, right? So here, so that we can hopefully increase this bar, right? But on the other hand, if we like take Q2, um, it has more items than Q3, you know, you know 1,815 uh, 1, of them, much more than Q3. So perhaps it's a better candidate group to do some more experiment, right? The supplier may want to uh, reduce some of the price uh, of, of the items and then see if traffic will grow and potentially grow revenue. So we want to increase this bar. Well, Q4 is a group that needs a further ex uh, examination and uh, possibly action, right? So perhaps look into bundle some of the Q4s uh, with uh, Q1 and then see if actually it helps sell them faster, right? And uh, perhaps purge some SKUs in it because it's, you know, when they are really very low quantity and very low margin, right? and or perhaps trade with other suppliers. Maybe these things don't sell well uh, in my store, but perhaps it will sell better in a different region based on the composition of the customers in the neighborhood, right? There is, a, a, we do see, we do observe differences among the, uh, uh, the selling, the things that sold in different locations, of, uh, obviously because of uh, different uh, profile of the customers, right? Right, so uh, basket recommendation or, um, or product recommendation, right? Well, the, the goal is to help merchant grow their business. So we want to make sure the recommendation is indeed beneficial to the merchant, not just because we think it's good, or it sells more money or something. We want to make sure it's beneficial. So if we make loans available saying, okay, we can guarantee you will sell it uh, and we give you loan to, to buy them to sell, well, still that, you know, the merchant might still say, you know, I don't know if I can sell them in time so that I can pay you back, right? And so that's important. So we need to know that we need to study what does that mean to be able to sell in time, right? So we want to uh, ponder the questions, you know, we, as we do the research, we need to ask those questions, right? So if the merchant take the recommendation, you know, would they be able to sell in time so that it does not hold up a working capital, right? So this is something we can uh, use machine learning to learn, to make certain predictions, um, to, to look into uh, potential future buying behavior in conjunction with uh, recommendation, or just looking at the selling speed and then turnover speed to look into that to help, um, uh, uh, help be sure that this can sell, 
right? Or we ask another question, like uh, given a basket, like the one showing here, um, you know, which suppose the merchant bought last time. And then we can ask the question, are there um, complementary, uh, maybe I should say complementary or substitutional items uh, that we should be suggesting to the merchant to add to or to substitute some items in the basket so that we can increase the selling speed or selling uh, or, 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 or margin for the, for the merchant, right? So I'll just uh, you know, quickly walk through a, a simple method to compute. Um, we have research and experimented with uh, several product recommendation algorithms. As you, you know, uh, some of you might know uh, that uh, recommendation has been studied by machine learning data scientists over the past, I would say, easily 20 years, and uh, is fairly common in e-commerce. And yet, with incomplete, inaccurate data in the traditional trade, this is a still not quite solved the problem. Uh, and definitely need more attention from technology provider to solve, right? So a simple algorithm I listed here would be, first, we compute the selling speed for each SKU and each merchant. And then we can rank the SKU by speed or rank them by the popular popularity, right? So those merchants that sell it. And we can rank top K. Uh, recommend the top K within the region, the location, or the time window, right? So let me explain how we compute the selling speed, right? So just want to get into a little bit of detail, so brain exercise. Uh, if, we, uh, if we line up the transactions by the timeline, and we have transaction S sub zero at the time, T sub zero, S sub one at T sub one, right? And so on. This is, there are multiple uh, items in, in each of the transactions. So S sub zero might contain you know, many items, right? So let's line up them as well. So we list the quantities that the merchant bought in that transaction. In this drawing, we show the merchant uh, U sub J and the sub uh, SKU S sub, uh, U sub I and the SKU S sub J, right? And uh, in this transaction, we line up the item uh, for the quantity uh, Q0 at the time zero, Q1 at the time one, right? So then the selling speed can be computed um, as uh, basically the quantities divided by the time, time gap. Uh, so this is a very intuitive computation of speed, right? So between the current time and the time when the, uh, the item was last bought, actually. So this is a QK greater than zero is important because we don't compute the gap when you know, sometimes they don't buy it, the same item, because the merchant may not buy the same item every time, right? So then the selling speed of SKUS sub J by merchant U sub I, right? At the time T sub K is computed by this formula, right? So this you need the, need the merchant, need the SKU, you need the time and compute this way, right? And then for the merchant and the SKU, you just average them up, right? This is a, a intuitive uh, way of computing the time speed when you know, we just need the transaction data. That's all we need. Right, we deployed the recommendation model to production and some, some here's the pretty pictures of some examples of a recommended SKUs. Um, tested result uh, seems to have uh, a lift in the uh, CTR, click through rate uh, by the merchant. So it, it did seem to attract uh, traffic, uh, not just click, but also bought. So the more interesting 62% um, of the merchants bought the item from the recommendation. They actually never bought that before, right? So this is a completely new item to them. 
and it was in a recommendation and they bought it. But if you compare the ones over, they have not bought over the last 30 years and it's in a recommendation and they bought it, right? So uh, we further measure of those items they bought based on the recommendation, did they buy again? Uh, so that means not only they judge as useful item, when they buy again, they actually sold, they got, it means we can assume they sold the item also. So that means they can be sold, right? So let me move on to uh, the next example where uh, I think this could be useful for helping uh, detecting uh, you know, behavior, uh, some ab abnormal behaviors in the usage of, uh, of the uh, uh, applications, which could imply some abnormal behaviors in the, uh, in the actors within the network. So we can construct a network from app usage data, right? So each other comes with a customer ID and device ID and, um, or some device characteristics, right? So, and we can construct the node by the customer ID and the device ID, right? So the nodes are device ID, customer ID, and then the edges are used to, um, to a, a edge exist to connect um, a customer ID and a device ID if that device was used to make that order on that account, right? So the account ID and device ID are connected by an edge if the order was made on that account by the device. So once we construct such a ne network, um, so you know, as the one on the right-hand side, this is a real example of the network. Um, we can uh, apply some various uh, graph algorithms onto this network to compute various properties and uh, metrics. Um, we can compute the edge degree um, uh, as the number of edges. So for instance, this node here, which is the, the yellow is a device ID, have so many uh, uh, account ID connected to it. So it means it has many, many edges and that uh, the uh, edge degree is computed as that. And then uh, if we normalize that number of edges connected to a particular node by the overall possible uh, edges, which actually is the total number of nodes minus one of the network, uh, we can we call that a uh, uh, a degree um, of cent yeah, centrality. We can compute that. So if we look at, look at this, this network is actually consists of various subgraphs. The subgraphs are the connected pieces. Mm -hmm. So if we look at each connected pieces, huh? so this one, this is fairly. Uh, looks quite clean and nice. Uh, Devices are connected to one or two uh, account maximum. So it, you know maybe they have two accounts for two types of purchases or two whatever. It's uh, you know reasonable. Um, if we look at uh, these subgraphs, right? And these subgraphs. So <clears throat> we can we can see some. Um, behaviors that uh, we need to examine a little bit further. So if we look at the middle row, <clears throat> the degree centra uh, centrality, right? Remember the edges connected to the node normalized by the total number of uh, possible edges, right? If that degree, if we compute the degrees uh, mean versus uh, the median, uh, compute that ratio that could indicate some uh, we could use that as a metric to indicate some uh, abnormal activities. So in this case, um, <clears throat> if we look at this subgraph here, this one is that this one has the um, the mean of uh, uh, edge uh, centrality, degree centrality is 
21 over 11, 20 over 11, right? Because you have 11 node, uh, 12 node, uh, uh, no, 11 node, and you have possible degrees sums up together and 20 over 10. Um, the median actually is one because uh, the, there are so many one. So, so these point, the central degree is just one. Huh? The degree just have one connection, right? So same, if you look at the, uh, this one, you can compute that there are a total number of uh, edges. And this one I computed is actually the, the mean um, over uh, median is actually eight point something. So you can actually manually compute the degree. So, so we can say those subgraphs actually have a uh, possibility of to be a sales device or some one device to help multiple merchants to make orders. That's possible. Avantunai does have a sales people to help a merchant, right? So that's a possibility. This is also even possible. Um, they have some other relationship. And here is a little bit concerning. Um, we, we see this is sub, some kind of a convoluted relationships among them. And then basically we could not, we can flag it and then get people to look at it. So I am um, moving on uh, to, uh, I can't, basically made a assignment. This one actually was a, um, a capstone project that we have conducted with Northeastern University uh, for their analytics um, uh, master degree program. We actually made the data uh, available. It's a sample data uh, with uh, uh, product names obfuscated. So that for privacy consideration and business sensitivity consideration. Um, so we made, uh, so feel free to check it out. And if you do want to play with this data, here are some questions to, that you can play with data and try to answer those questions. And those questions are obviously, uh, uh, you know, uh, important to us, but probably useful for us to serve um, the micro SMEs better. And here I provide some samples uh, reference. Uh, the first few are about the, about the, the, the business uh, micro SMEs. And then um, the couple of the middle, this, this is about more how to compute some of the inventory related supply chain analytics and uh, some for product recommendation, you can look into some of the uh, latest research uh, if you have interest as well. So I think I'm a little bit ahead of time. We can open for questions. And I'd be happy to go back to any of the slides. So I've been zooming through lots of them. Okay, thank you very much for Dr. Lee for a very interesting presentation um, relating to the FMCG supply chain uh, digitalization and also embedded financing, especially for um, SMEs. Yeah. So now we invite the participants to, uh, if you have any questions, you can um, raise your hands. Yep, Jilan Kanchana. Yep. Um, sorry, uh, doctor. Yep. I was looking at the, I was interested in the GitHub link that you posted. Um, but when I click the link, it doesn't open to a, um, like a data set that you said it would. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe like, yeah, you show us what the data looks like, maybe if it's not available. Okay. Uh, let me, uh, quit this sharing and, and go to GitHub for you. Do you see my screen? Yes. Do you see this um, now? Yeah. 
it's a CSV file. Um, it's fairly big, uh, the link. So if you go to the, the root repo, do you see this? Yep. Okay, now you got it, right? Or you can download this. Right? Uh, let me just try doing that. Yeah. Okay, um, excuse me, Dr. Lee. Um, can we uh, continue to the next question or would you yeah. like to share um, your link? Before? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can, okay. uh, sorry, so, so sorry. No yeah, keep yeah. going questions. Yeah, yeah, well, I can, okay. I can parallel. Yeah, all right, thank you. Um, John, um, do you have any questions for Dr. Lee? I've got a question that is on page, from page 17, that basically from page 15 to page 17, we can see there's a nini here, we can see the nini, the, nini we, we, the doctor has shared with us a basket recommendation that a particular platform can easily recommend to a specific client. Now, I've got two questions. The first question, it deals with privacy and that, privacy and data protection of users. Consider that Yes, we know we are living in an age whereby our machines, unfortunately, are much cleverer than us human beings. And sometimes, and it's easy for, for the algorithms to manipulate the minds of consumers. Therefore, my question is, is there, any, is there, a, is there a legal provision or which, which might be put in place in order to protect consumers from receiving recommendations of products which they don't want to purchase, but of which, unfortunately, as consumers, because of, because of the way our minds play with us, we can easily purchase because, we, because we've received recommendations. Therefore, is there any re way for consumers to be protected from receiving certain re product recommendations? Okay. okay. Um, so the question, let me repeat, to make a recommendations, uh, the question is, is there any method of control mechanism to put in place so that um, consumers don't uh, buy what they don't need, or we don't make recommendations that they don't need. Um, so the recommendation is more about uh, helping the merchant to balance out their stock. So they run a store uh, in the, as uh, I show some of the, the, in the pictures, they run the store, they have uh, certain stock items and uh, have it is definitely a topic for uh, that need to be studied with care you you don't want to recommend something that uh, they will not uh, uh, it will not be beneficial to them so in our case we um, make sure in multiple criteria one criteria is that the selling speed is reasonable among similar regions or similar um, uh, 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 store um, uh, uh, profiles, right? So that's one. And then two is that we actually make the model to fit such that we have a high confidence that uh, they will be able to sell so that they will repurchase that item. Like I mentioned, we measure and we test. We will not just blindly let the machine run through, right? So at the end, 
if, the, if we are not selling to the consumers directly, so we actually do not have the actual information about the end consumer. Um, we have information about the merchant because we also uh, provide financing and then business support to them. So to them, we are providing those services. And so therefore, utilizing the data to provide a suitable service to them. Um, we take that, obviously take that um, uh, uh, information security or privacy uh, very seriously. This, you can consider this uh, in the, you know, in the general sense of data sensitivity and security, uh, handling finance related data needs to, to pass uh, various uh, regulations. So Avantuna actually is licensed to provide such service, which means um, regulate, regularly reviewed and uh, audited and reported. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Lee and also John. Uh, next, uh, I believe Azra uh, has got a question to ask. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Is my voice audible? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, I want to ask a few questions, ma'am. Um, firstly, is there any disadvantages when the trade leaves its traditionality? And the second one is, what are the challenges of FMCG nowadays when they want to deliver technological development to the merchants, which maybe comes from the older generation? Thank you, ma'am. Mm, very good questions. Um, the first one, um, indeed, overall, if you look at uh, over time, uh, the traditional trade is, uh, has been declining slowly. Um, but uh, it, it did. Uh, this is, uh, you know, as customers moving on into the modern trade, right? So that has been the case, but still majority. So the top channel for supplies, uh, for the FMCG supplies to in Indonesia. So these are my knowledge based on reading the researchers and statistics uh, done by, uh, by the expert. This, um, um, so your second question is about perhaps the second generation. If I just uh, help me verify, I got your question correctly that uh, the first generation versus second generation or, or newer generation of the merchants or store owners, um, are they uh, uh, like, uh, do they have the af uh, affinity to the traditional store or do they adopt, uh, do they have a higher likelihood to adopt a newer, technologies so that they can run their traditional business in a more modern way. Did I get that question correct? Uh, yes, it's correct, ma'am. Okay, so basically between generations, yes, indeed, we actually see differences. Uh, we do have customers actually have uh, 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 generations. So the older generation, um, so, Basically, when we design the product, we, we study the uh, uh, sufficient size of customers to what we design as a personas, right? So one of the persona is the newer generation. They're very tech, tech savvy. Uh, they grow up somewhat digital, uh, maybe in their 30s and start to take responsibility of the store. Um, we also have another persona where the, the store owners is a little bit older and uh, uh, not very old actually, but uh, because they have run the store for a while and they have been uh, running the way they have. And so they may not have um, uh, 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 adopted 
uh, the uh, new technologies. And not uh, you know we are not the only one to be in this business. So, but they have not adopted uh, others as well. So this is a second uh, uh, persona we actually work with. Uh, where, so therefore, designing the system that are meeting the needs of tech savvy, and uh, as well as getting the adoption from the older generation. That is a very, uh, a very real challenge. So I wouldn't claim that we have fully solved it, but I do believe through thorough study of the needs, fundamentally needs are the, uh, as I listed, uh, getting the financing, control the inventory, uh, be smart about uh, the, where they put their uh, in, uh, inventory, uh, working capital to purchase inventory and be able to forecast. Even those uh, older generation, they say they can run their business uh, you know, without uh, thinking too much. Um, but when they grow their business, uh, they may experience the need to, to, you know, they may no longer able to uh, anticipate uh, the need for uh, for you know like by the customer, so they may need to say, "I need to get help to help me forecast." So my previously, I just you know based on I just talk to my neighbors, talk to my customers. I I'm in the store, I know, but now as I handle five hundred customers, I may not be able to anticipate the demand as accurately. Hopefully that answer your question. Um, yes, thank you, ma'am. Yeah. So the key is to have that suite of product and then end-to-end -end solutions where inventory management, order management, and then ordering apps. So, and taking care of the flow of inventory flow, payment flow, information flow. So with that way, we may not be able to even if we are not able to meet everybody's every need, but hopefully we can meet some critical needs of majority of the sectors. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Lee, for the explanation. And next we have uh, Aisha. Uh, so uh, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the great presentation. So as someone who uh, have interested in information system audit, I'm really curious about uh, how does the this mobile app can detect fraud? Uh, can you specify what kind of fraud that can be detected by this Avantonai mobile app? And why does sub subgraph in the network who have many connections between device and accounts can be interpreted as fraud activities? Thank you. Um. So, like I said, potentially, um, it, it, because of the financing is uh, is embedded, uh, if um, someone can impersonalize a customer and to get the financing, right? And then someone can make false transactions to get financing, right? So the network is not a definitive. Um, uh, stamp to say yes or no fraud. Uh, it can be used also as a tool, uh, even outside fraud, to say identify the needs of the customer, right? So we can see some of those customers relying on one person to help them make orders. Then we can design the tool we need to improve on the tool. Perhaps we need to visit them and then to, to, to really understand their need and then their barriers. Um, so in terms of fraud, I probably should not get into too much details about the type of fraud. You know, you don't talk too much about details uh, because there's bad uh, actors around, but suffice to say um, that uh, potentially uh, people who have access to uh, some of the account could uh, you know could be even friends or neighbors, but could try to potentially abuse it. Uh, it may not even be just completely uh, evil, but uh, perhaps abuse it, uh, use it for different intent. 
different mm-hmm. intent of the funding because the the intent of the funding is to support the inventory purchase, right? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lee and also Aisha. And next we have Owen. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. So as we all know, banks are reluctant to lend to money, to lend money to MSMEs because of their uncertainty and the lack of data regarding the business. So in this case, what can machine learning and AI do in order to reduce the information asymmetry and in the end, increase financial inclusion. Thank you. Mm, very good question. Indeed, that's exactly at the heart of our study. Um, I do think I want tonight, this one I have to speak a little bit in the sense of uh, uh, both on the business side, uh, the company, as well as on the machine learning data science side of which you asked, right? So, so on the business side, to be able to control uh, the risk, to you know, uh, to reduce the risk or control the risk or minimize the risk, uh, that's very important. But in the meantime, to maintain the cost of running the business. Uh, we also need to look into what can be automated, right? So that we can scale and do not incur too much cost. So I can, I can say a few things uh, in terms of automating uh, to, to uh, that, that what can we do to be better at uh, the traditional banks to be able to support and include the micro SMEs, right? So uh, one thing is that indeed uh, working with the digitization of supply chain, it gave us those data that are really are um, important and useful to help assess whether the applicant is actually really conducting a business other than their own self-declared attribute. They say, oh, I'm a I'm a business person, I have a business registration of such, I have this store place, and uh, my, my typical transaction a month is X amount of money. But then we, with the supply chain data, we can verify those and we can, um, we can control the risk uh, with additional data uh, than the traditional banks. Uh, so traditional banks needed the collateral, and in our case, if we uh, have the data to, um, to verify the business, then to really know that the, the transaction is indeed buying and stocking the stores to sell. Therefore, um, we can say there is a, you know, that we can estimate the likelihood of, um, of the uh, applicants. To be, um, you know, to be trustworthy and then pay back. And of course, the machine. So now I'm got, coming back to the machine learning model side. Um, can we, as I mentioned, we start with conservative. We can also control the volume of the landing so that we can build models and then let it run to gather some more data so that we can learn whether we can. Uh, make the model less conservative. Conservative meaning uh, just means that uh, you know we have less loss, right? The less uh, probability of uh, being uh, losing money. Uh, so if we start with my very small, and then we can collect some data and tune the machine learning model continuously. So that's where uh, machine learning data science can come in to help. Um, so if you think about the first model deployed, it may approve a few of very few, or it may only touch on the small volume. Um, but with more response data, let's look at whether how many of them repaid back, repaid on time. And uh, if we see, oh, all of the ones that we approved repaid back, then we have a higher confidence. So perhaps let's loosen the threshold a little bit more to see, uh, you know, obviously when you loosen the threshold, you approve more. 
And then when you approve more, there is a higher chance that some of them may not repay back. Um, then you evaluate the data. So it is a continuous process. Um, from the data science perspective, uh, I often tell my team members that the time we deploy the model, the actual real work actually starts because that's when you have to watch and monitor the behavior of the model in the wild and then to really ensure we don't lose money. Because the moment we lose more money, then we can no longer um, provide affordable. And that's why the banks needed all the collaterals because they cannot, they don't want to lose money this way. If And yet micro SME don't have those collaterals so they cannot get the credit. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Uh, now we move on to the next uh, participant, uh, Bramantio. Okay. Uh, okay. So thank you for the opportunity and the lecture. So let's say a supplier cannot predict their product quality, but they want to branch out to more merchants. Can I want to know AI or machine learning give solution to a supplier that have inconsist inconsistent product quality? Like when they harvest their product, some of it can be bad or good. And how can they, so how can they branch out to merchants if that is the case? They also live in remote place where internet is unavailable most of the time. Would that be an issue? That is my question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good question. Uh, so uh, I'll answer your second question first. So in, indeed, we actually have that as a part of our design principle that uh, we, uh, uh, we design our apps uh, based on uh, a very low uh, requirement on the uh, bandwidth and also considered when the device and uh, even the computers might be offline. Uh, so that then we can ensure there is no um, the 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 business can continue to be conducted, and in the meantime, uh, data can uh, uh, can be saved in a way and then synced up when the network is better. So uh, yeah, this is in the design principle, and then your first question. Uh, let me clarify if uh, uh, I get your first question correctly. So your, your question was that if, if a merchant, if a supplier is selling some uh, you know, inventories to a merchant and, uh, and yet the quality of the inventory is bad, so how could we help the merchant to know the quality is good or bad. Is that your question? Uh, no. Uh, how do we help the suppliers know whether there are the amount of product that will be available and be put out to, to the merchant to be taken? Okay, got it, got it. Uh, so let me still clarify. Do you mean whether the supplier has enough supplies to uh, serve all their merchant, or or did you or, or do you mean whether the supplier can prepare the order in time uh, to be ready when the merchant come? The first or the second? The first. The first. So, yes. So the supplier can put out a fixed amount of product. A fable. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is where in the um, I yeah I don't know how many of you in the audience are uh, major in study the retail business, right? Uh, I it's new to me, and I'm learning that because my training uh, was a data scientist and working. I've worked in other fields. Um, so um, I think in general the submerge the suppliers would have a way to keep, this is a, what they call the reorder point. So if their stock is below certain item, they will, uh, uh, they will stock more. 
So in the case of supplier, they will go to the distributor center, they go to the principal to buy more of the, let's say the water bottle, right? So they typically have a replenishment point. And then in our system, we can build that into the system when we have the complete inventory information, right? So this could be challenging if our inventory information is not accurate. Right, or if uh, if the supplier, like I said, don't have an accurate count of their inventory, right? So how how could we help them to ensure that they have enough uh, inventory? Um, that is a real uh, a real need. Um, a, a lot of them solve by visual inspection. Right, so if they don't have a system fully set up, if they only partially use our system, or if they are new and they have like the example I quoted, they never fully counted. So how do they know they have uh, enough? They kind of uh, 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 like think about the quadrant analysis I show you. They, they usually watch a small number of them, right? to say of these items, they can never be running out, right? So they will always watch those. So in our system, then how do we help them that we can in build that in the system to say, uh, here's your watch list. And we can even uh, build in data science uh, forecasting to say um, that we can uh, forecast potential need on holidays coming up, summer seasonal change, we can forecast and we can set the reorder threshold for them to reorder and send, uh, send the reminders uh, to the, to the uh, suppliers. I hope that answers your question. So the Awantunai can, can put out a reminder and also Reminder of, of what the owner can do and and the whole forecasting if there is a defective product. That's what you're saying. Yes. Um I'm I although I'm not saying everything was built already, right? So yes, definitely is on the on the uh, need list, uh, requirement list to be built. Uh, some are built, so we do have a dashboard uh, for the uh, for the business person to look at it, monitor it, uh, to see what what's sold fast, what's running low, uh, if they use the full system uh, in a complete manner. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lee and Bramantio. And next, we move on to Zafi. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity. So my question is actually quite simple compared to the previous ones. So uh, in one of the slides, it is shown that information exchange between uh, suppliers are incomplete, hence at the dashed information line. I think it was about the view of flow. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, what is the significance of complete data exchange between uh, suppliers? Maybe you can elaborate a bit more because I still fail to grasp uh, the actual essence of it. Uh, between you. between the suppliers or uh, or between supplier among the supplier themselves or between supplier among, and uh, and the principal among the suppliers themselves uh, among the suppliers themselves um, yeah they, this some suppliers you know uh, if uh, again it's about adoption and uh, whether they are in our, our, our network already or not. Um, so in general, this is the only part that solid line is uh, that we, because they sell and they buy, supplier sell, merchant buy. So this is very clear. But the, when the supplier buys things from others, if they buy from another supplier that's in our system, we would know. But if they, uh, in our network, we would know. If they buy from uh, some uh, warehouse or wholesaler that we have little visibility, we would not know that. Um, then possibly we would still know if 
the supplier keeps a record of the inventory also, right? So if they say, okay, we bought this from that, and we actually know um, some of that, we just cannot know complete. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. And now we have Jofan. Yes, ma'am. If I may, I want to ask a question. Uh, it's kind of related to the previous question relating the risk. I think it is one of my important questions in this session. I'm, uh, for example, uh, in a big merchant, most of the big merchant is, uh, if they want to get some capital, they go to the bank. And that bank is most of the time have a, we can say a background check that uh, to, uh, to mitigate the asymmetry risk between the loaner and the merchant, for example, like that. In this case, we talk about MSME, where most of the time MSME uh, cannot get loan from the bank. I think what uh, what interested in this topic is that it's A129. Uh, I'm a little bit uh, have a, read a summary about the A129. I think the business is kind of really interesting, A129. Uh, my question is that, um, I'm a little bit searching about the Awan tonight and I watched one of their video about uh, one of the merchant, for example, like that man. So the merchant is basically said that previously before the Awan tonight, they need to pay some kind, they sometimes when they buy bulk item, they pay later, not at the time of the transaction. For example, they buy at day one, but they pay in the week two or what. And that merchant example, by using an Awan tonight, they could pay for 30 days like that instead of two weeks. Uh, my, my question is that in a bank, a bank have a way to mitigate the risk of cannot pay those those uh, first, I'm sorry if I forgot the English, with the first batch of the bulk item like that. Like for example, using a background check to make mitigate that or a credit check like that. And another thing is using, I'm sorry, maybe a little bit uh, explicit, maybe using uh, someone who forced them to pay them. I forget the name, like someone like that, uh, forcing them to pay if they do not pay like that. Now my question is how I want to know mitigate the stress man for example does i want to know have a background check like that a debt collector yes sometimes i'm sorry it is a little bit explicit sometimes a bank uh, mitigate that by using a debt collector at the end of the day how i want to know mitigate the stress i think because i want to know uh company is really interesting man but those are i think one of the important thing if if for example i want to make business like an i want to know like that Thank you, ma'am. What happened if they cannot pay like that, ma'am? And how do they how do they trust their their merchant that they can pay after thirty days like that? Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, one key um, uh, principle and then aspiration of uh, Avantana really is uh, to um, uh, really in the heart of our co-founders is to help is to help them prosper. So therefore, um, I actually absolutely do no harm for sure. But also when things like that happen, if it's really, uh, in your case, you're trying to explain is that if, if in this case, it's someone who really uh, sincere wants to pay back, but somehow just could not pay back, right? If that's the case versus someone who just plainly coming out and fraud at you, right? So that's two different types. So in Avant to my, tonight, um, the, it is very important for Avant tonight to build the trust relationships uh, with the suppliers and merchants, with our customers. So um, that, 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 uh, in the case, I can quote examples, like um, I hear uh, from uh, our co-founders, examples are actually uh, when such a case happened in the past, uh, it turns out uh, potentially the customer, uh, the merchant or supplier ran into some uh, difficulties in their own situation, right? Things happen, right? family, uh, things happened and some, um, you know, unexpected um, uh, situations happen. 
And so in this case, actually, I want to actually turn around to help them get out of that unfortunate situation first, and then actually um, uh, uh, get them back on track to business, and then over time pay back. So this case actually is a real story. So um, yeah, I mean, I hope that kind of answered your question in the sense where, yes, there are people who fraud. That's not the case we're talking about because we would just need to, uh, well, we actually try to catch them and then to say, hey, you know, don't do this, right? The key is to catch earlier and then see some, you know, kind of a behavior that's kind of strange. And then to actually say, give them a call to say, hey, don't do this. Let's get back on track and do this in the, in the right way. Or if we see people truly cannot, um, cannot pay back, we actually look into that because we actually do have a business expertise. Uh, you know, some people are very knowledgeable in the FMCG space. Some people are very knowledgeable in the uh, retail uh, analytics. For instance, the quadrant example I showed you, uh, we have lots, quite a few domain experts that with lots of knowledge. They actually can turn around to, to help the merchant or supplier to say, hey, where is the difficulty? Let's get over this, uh, solve the difficulty first, right? So I hope that answered the question, which is that for fraud, we try to get people get out of it. For actually inability to pay back, perhaps we seek method ways to help them because we do have a network of uh, uh, customers. Perhaps if they cannot sell well, you know, some people don't run their store well, they cannot sell. They may know how to keep books, but they may not be able to sell things. And if they bought something and not able to sell, right? Perhaps we can help and we can use different method to help them. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Maybe just for confirmation, ma'am, uh, when an Awantuna has a background check in a merchant, is it really hard to join Awantuna, ma'am, if I may? Maybe that's my last question, ma'am. Is that's the background? Is there any minimum of capital like that, ma'am? For example, mm -mm, mm -mm. Oh. no, no, yes. yeah. Well, <clears throat> we and we do have uh, uh, some data uh, needed to be filled in the application stage. We call the know your customer, right? So um, some very basic KYC, know your customer data attributes are needed uh, because. It, it's required by regulatory, um, but uh, I don't believe we require capital because that's the whole uh, uh, asset or collateral because that's the whole point to help them include them. Um, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for Dr. Lee and also Jofan for the question. So we have reached the end of this session just in time 3.30 p.m. And once again, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lee, for uh, delivering a very interesting and also fruitful topic regarding FMCG supply chain digitalization and financing, especially in MSMEs. And I believe that uh, we also had a very interesting and also fruitful discussion with all the participants. So once again, a big thank you for Dr. Lee. And maybe we can give a big round of applause for Dr. Lee. Yeah, big appreciation for Dr. Lee. Okay, thank you very much, um, Dr. Lee. Um, we hope to welcome you again in another event. And also thank you to all the participants that have joined in uh, today's session. And we'll see you all again at 4 p.m. for another lecture session with Dr. Mardani Satyawan. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Thank you.